Can the Republican Party be a governing party again? Let's find out in episode 72 of En Route. where we talk about the journey of faith and how it intersects with religion, politics, and culture. I'm Dennis Sanders, your host. In this episode, I welcome back Ariel Hill Davis, the policy director for Republican Women for Progress. With populist candidates like J.D. Vance, Marjorie Taylor Greene, and Madison Cawthorn, you have to wonder, can the GOP ever become a serious governing party again? Ariel thinks that there is still a chance, and she's working hard to support candidates who have a chance to defeat incumbents like Green. With Democrats on track to lose the House of Representatives in November, the hope is to have representatives in the GOP that are more interested in policy than in owning the libs. Is there still hope for the GOP? Let's find out with R.L. Hill Davis. Well, R.L., it is great to have you back. Thank you so much. I'm really excited to be back. You know, it's always nice to talk about my favorite topics of, you know, where the GOP currently is and, you know, where the good people are and and how people are trying to restore some sanity. So really excited to be back. So everyone basically coming into 2022, the kind of common wisdom is that uh, the Democrats are going to lose, probably lose the House. Well, probably actually pretty much everyone says they will lose the House and might lose the Senate. Um, and so everyone then is looking at what's happening with the GOP, um, okay. which is interesting. Um, as they like to say, that's a Minnesota way of saying it's nuts. And, <laughs> and so, you know, the question is, coming into 2022, people are wondering, is there any hope? Um, to right the ship, or are we just going to be going in, you know, in stumbling into this, um, or should we just, you know, put our all our chips into the Democratic Party? Um, I know that you are someone that wants to stay in the fight, so I guess the first question is, why should we still do that? Yeah, absolutely. I think the the, the first time I was on um, your podcast, I ended with you know, where I find hope, which is in having conversations with significantly younger Republicans, um, Republicans who come from very different backgrounds than my own, um, that seem to have organically kind of developed more of a a kind of type of Republicanism that mirrors what I think it should be, which is kind of old school, business conservative, been called New England Republican, which also means some in some circles, I'm a rhino, Um, you know, take your pick of how you want to describe us. Um, You know, I do want to stand and fight. I think um, sometimes this is a really hard topic of conversation for people because I think innately my stand and fight is kind of grounded in not necessarily my wishes for where our our political system is, but the reality of our political system. And so I think sometimes for people, it's hard to find hope in a place where you're talking about, I want to prevent the further degradation of my party, not so much I want, I mean, I would love to be in a place where I I could have a party that really reflects my brand of republicanism still, Um, but we're not quite there yet. Um, And so I think for some people, it's really hard to, to see kind of the light at the end of the tunnel when you're thinking, you know, how do I stand and fight for a party that really isn't representing me and seems to be trending in the wrong direction? And then I look across the aisle and see the other party trending in a direction that also, you know, is getting further and further away from from something that I would, um, you know, I would like to see in my my political party. Um, But I think the reality is this, right? We, 
we live in a two party system right now. And so you got to, you got to pick your lane and the biggest way that you can have an impact. And we, my organization, Republican Women for Progress has been saying this for years. The biggest way you can have an impact is by making sure that you exercise your right to vote um, frequently uh, whenever you get the chance, specifically in primaries. So what that means is that if you don't live in an open primary state, you know, you have to pick your party in terms of which one you want to influence more, right? And I just happen to to be in the Republican Party. I've been in it for years. Um, you know, I quite frankly look at what's been going on in the administration the last year and I admit I'm I'm really disappointed. I really thought that Joe Biden was going to going to be a more moderating force and kind of a not just a return to order in terms of getting things done, but in terms of really trying to to bridge the gap. Mm -hmm. um, and I haven't seen that happen. And so for that reason, I also look across the aisle and I think to myself, I don't see myself in the Democratic Party. I haven't for years, but I certainly don't at this point. I'm not progressive. Um, and so to me, it's where can I have the best impact? And the the best impact in my opinion is still staying in the Republican Party and trying to make sure that, you know, we elect people who are actually, you know, more of the mindset of my brand of Republicanism and not this kind of populist Trumpist streak that we've seen kind of really get some legs under it um, for the last five years. Um, one of the things I think that's being, it seems like is happening right now within the party, um, I believe it was, you Late last year was when the infrastructure package went through the House. Um, well, it went through the Senate first. You got 19 Republicans. That was actually amazing in, in this day and age to get that many. And then it went to the House, and you got 13 Republicans that voted in favor. Mm -hmm. And that's when the death threat started happening. I mean, people, they got basically hit with people angry at them, they thought they were traitors. People with even within their own caucus were saying that they were terrible and they should, uh, you know, they should be primaried. And yeah. and so it seems like it's harder and harder for, and I think this is it's in both parties, but it's harder and harder for any lawmaker to chart their own independent path um, to vote with their district. And now it, you have to vote with your party. It doesn't really, no one cares about whether it's the district that you live in, it's you have to vote this strange way. So if you're trying to get people who are interested in, in actually governing, how do you do that when you have this environment where people are not really interested in, in helping to you know, get the, the process of governing going? Yeah, I think that's an excellent question. And um, look, I was horrified at how people were treated after taking that vote on a non-controversial, bipartisan investment in our infrastructure and hard infrastructure in this country, right? Like that, it blew my mind. Um, these are dollars that we've known we've needed in our systems for years. This should not have been a partisan issue. Um, and I, I admit, I you know, I work with some younger folks and who are, you know, sometimes more conservative than I am. Um, and I was pretty horrified that one of them following that infrastructure vote said to me, you know, CACO should be raked over the coals, right? Like he broke the line and he gave Democrats a win. And I was like, he's governing. What? I don't understand how you can be angry at him for doing his job. He's governing. And this isn't about winning political points. So I think first and foremost, we have to, as the electorate, we have to step away from this idea that we are electing people into federal office or state or local for that matter, um, that are, and with the idea that they're there to win points against the other side. They're not, they're there to govern. Um, and sometimes that means that there are going to be compromises that you know, you maybe don't like or that you don't understand, but when you're voting for somebody, you're voting because you either like the way that they think through things or you trust their judgment. And trusting someone's judgment doesn't mean that you're going to agree with them all the time. Um, but so I think as the electorate, we need to start taking more kind of ownership and accountability for our votes also um, and how how we're choosing our elected officials and who we're sending to Congress. Um, what I do actually think is really interesting, though, is because we live in this world where um, social media is very present, people feel very free to, you know, lob death threats at, at elected officials. Um, it seems like that's 
kind of everyone, but I don't actually think it is. And I think once people look at something like the bipartisan infrastructure bill and see that money starting to come back into their districts and into their home, you know, their states and helping to shore up our infrastructure, that feels very different than kind of tuning into your news channel and hearing that, you know, your Republican representative voted with Democrats, right? Like, those Republicans were voting with their conscience and they were voting to bring money into their states and districts to help help people and improve people's lives. And I think focusing on that and trying to actually go back to the old standard of all politics being local, whereas right now I think we're very much in this like all politics is national and that doesn't help people's lives. Um, the local components, the state components, and then how the federal level comes in and partners on those levels is how people's lives are improved. Um, I, but I think that that's a very different echo chamber than we get through our media consumption. Do you think it's a challenge these days because, because of things like our, our media, our social media, and I think other things that have made our politics far more tribal in that we don't want to, we see the other side, not just as this other side, but something that's going to destroy our country as we know it. I mean, is it, how do we basically try to push back against that? Because it just seems like almost impossible to try to get back to that old dynamic of all politics as opposed to our, our local. Now it seems we're just stuck in this national politics all the time phase. Yeah. Um, I will go back to my old standard. My first part of the answer is my old standard. Everybody needs to stop watching cable news. Like it does not do anything good for anyone. It is not real news. It's entertainment. And those models are built on eliciting an emotional response, which is not grounded in, in kind of, you get more of an emotional response when people are afraid or when they're, you know, keyed up voting for their sports team. Right. So First and foremost, I think people just need to stop, which is not the same as not consuming news, but stop watching cable news. Um, and then I, I really will give credit to organizations like Better Angels. Um, I think we need to have people actively going out of their way to have conversations um, in, you know, in formats that are that are geared towards you know, having these conversations, not creating tension or not where you're at, you know, a rally or a protest and you're yelling at people across the line, but really having conversations with people who have different ideas than you do about how this country should be governed and, and led. Um, because I think that naturally will dial down, you know, the energy levels. Um, once you realize that and I use this example quite frequently. One of my best friends uh, works for Al Jazeera, right? Like we don't make any sense as friends on paper. Like I am, you know, a Republican. We do not agree on, on so many things. And she is one of my best friends. I love her dearly. And she helps me articulate points and change points in terms of taking in different inputs and thinking through things in a different manner. Um, and I think everybody should have that in their lives. Like if you just agree with everybody that's in your life, I think your life is not as rich. And it also allows you to be afraid of your neighbors who may have different, different beliefs. Um, and I think we just need to get to a point in this country where we all take a deep breath, count to 10 and realize that like your neighbors are not out to get you. <laughs> Right. Like, mm -hmm. that, like it will help everything if you just can say we disagree politically, but you are not out to get me and you're not trying to ruin my way of life. Hmm. So one other thing is, how do we. I hate to use the word sane because I, that's not really I never yeah. like the whole thing, but how do we actually kind of draw up a, a faction or a coalition of people who want a different kind of politics, who want people who actually govern, um, who are willing to make compromises, who are principled, yes, but but they're yeah. willing to also make compromises because it seems like that's not going to just appear. Um, and sometimes that's what I hear from uh, from probably people that you and I would agree are would be on the, the same side that will just think that people will just do the right thing. And mm -hmm. I don't think it happens that way. So how do we get that kind of coalition to come together? Yeah. Um, so I think there are two different elements that I want to tease out a little bit here. Uh, I think the first is looking at 
the makeup of our current um, you know, Congress and where our leaders are and going into the midterms and what that means for certain Republicans. Um, so for me, what's kind of infusing, I think, some more principle, I want to call it like passionate principles, <laughs> like, but people who want to govern and do the hard work of governing. Um, I think from my perspective, Going into the midterms, what's really important is protecting the folks that we currently have in office that have demonstrated a willingness to govern even when it is, you know, politically uncomfortable or they're worried about being called out. Again, the 13 Republicans who voted for the bipartisan infrastructure bill, those are people that I think, you know, and not all of them are, are running again because of redistricting and other, other components. But um Looking really at Republicans, and I think we'll be able to do this in 2024, thinking about Democrats being in the minority, like where who are the Democrats that are kind of coming coming to the middle or who are trying to, to broker kind of agreements or bipartisan solutions for things? Um, those would be the people that I would be pointing to. I adding to those 13 Republicans, um, and some, there's some overlap here, but then also the Republicans who've taken hard votes related to January 6th and the insurrection, um, you know, Republicans who have taken hard votes on impeachment um, because of January 6th, you know, obviously I think Liz Cheney is the, is kind of like the gold standard here. Um, and I think looking at those folks and supporting them financially, door knocking, um, if you live in their district or their state or phone banking, Banking for them, right? I think um, so much because so much revolves around fear right now in our political systems. You basically have to demonstrate that there's support for these people who are being more level-headed, um, you know, while they're serving in office. And so I think that's kind of step one is just reinforcing that there's space and that those folks are politically viable. So for Republican Women for Progress, we've long said. Well, long said being like a year, things change yearly, right? Depending on who wins the elections. But we've said for the last year, we can't talk about whether or not Donald Trump has taken over the party because we aren't going to know until after we get through the primary season for the 2022 midterms, right? Um, Donald Trump is backing a whole bunch of primary challengers to anybody that who thinks or that he feels was politically disloyal to him. Um, now, a measure of his actual power within the party is going to be whether or not those primary challengers beat the incumbents. So I think if you care about um, turning away from kind of Trumpism or that brand of, of Republicanism, I don't really consider it Republicanism, but if, if, if you want to turn away from that, the best thing you can do is be supporting the people that he's targeting right now, because there has to be an alternative vision for the Republican Party. I also think that Senator, Senate Leader Mitch McConnell um, has done a, a great job in terms of repeatedly saying that he thinks we need to be moving in a different direction. So we have kind of these two dueling tracks right now in our party. And I think it's incredibly important for anybody who's paying attention to that um, to lend their support on the side that they think is right. Um, in the long term, you know, I think that to get people in office that, again, I, I would say, I agree with you, I don't like the same insane component. I think like level-headed, pragmatic is where I think of things. Um, again, I think that we have to demonstrate that there's support for those candidates um, across both the aisles, right? I mean, moderates on both sides are the reason that anything get done um, in Congress. And I understand that people are really upset with how our government is working. And there are a lot of feelings that it's it's broken. And I don't disagree that it's broken, but my feeling on why it's broken is very different from other people's. Um, I, you know, I think it's broken because we haven't incentivized people to work across the aisle. We disincentivize people compromising and having conversations and, you know, agreeing to disagree, but not be disagreeable without those kind of aspects of governing, you can't get anything done because then what you're basically saying is you need a super majority <laughs> and the presidency in order to pass your, your legislation, which just leaves everybody in a lurch in this country. Mm -hmm. So I think, um, you know, getting out and voting, I think also if you feel like you want to run, you absolutely should, right? Um, I, I think 
I just had a meeting the other day with a wonderful candidate, Jennifer Strahan, who is running a primary against Marjorie Taylor Greene. Um, she's an excellent candidate. She is a little bit more conservative than I am, more socially conservative than I am, but she came into the race because she was like, I don't think that this is how my community is better represented or best represented. Um, and Marjorie Taylor Greene is not delivering on anything for her constituencies. Um, and so, you know, I want to do right by my, um, by my community. And so she doesn't come from a political background, but she's decided to get into this race. Um, she's a really compelling candidate. I'm super excited about her. But I think that that also is this other, uh, this other piece is that if you care about politics, if you care about policy in the direction of this country, and you think that you have, you know, you have ideas or that you are interested in running, run for something. Um, I think, you know, we got to get people who don't see themselves as politicians running. <laughs> mm -hmm. Do you, um, with this uh, person that's challenging Marjorie Taylor Greene, um, do you know what the out, the prospects of um, for her are in her district? Is there a solid chance um, that she could actually? Uh, yeah, be? well, I I believe so. Okay. Um, I think some, they just two weeks ago, or was it might have even been last week, goodness, I feel like I'm losing track of time these days, Dennis. Um, they just had some interesting polling come out that basically ties Jennifer Strahan with Marjorie Taylor Greene. Um, interestingly enough, the redistricting also really is going to be helpful here in Georgia um, because Marjorie Taylor Greene won by 12,000 votes uh, in her primary. And in the redistricting, she lost basically two of her strongholds that would account for around 10,000 of those votes. Um, and the district picked up an additional, I think, 78,000 of like potential like likely voters. So when you're looking at that margin of error, um, it's, I think, going to be a much tighter race than people would assume if you're just looking at, you know, Twitter. I mean, well, I know that Margaret Taylor is not on Twitter anymore, but kind of the, the public persona and the assumption Mm -hmm. um, you know, I also think that Jennifer is doing a really good job of getting out and talking to people in the district and is really focused again on um, the efficiency of who's who's representing, you know, Georgia 14 in D.C. and the fact that, you know, Marjorie Taylor Greene not only is not seated on any committees, she's repeatedly stated that she doesn't want to be on committees um, and she hasn't introduced a piece of legislation that's been taken up by committees since last April. So, like, this is not somebody who's who's trying to represent her people right uh, back in Georgia. And so like, I think that there's a compelling message there and a lot of interest um, from what I've, I've heard from Jennifer's campaign um, on, on what it looks like. And I think it's still going to be, look, it's going to be a campaign. It's going to be a tough campaign. Name recognition is really important. Mm -hmm. um, but I think, I don't think that, that it's kind of an insurmountable feat. Do you see, are there any others um, that are out there that are challenging some of the more um, hardline populist folk? Um, and who are they? Who should, who should we be, know, um, people should know about? Oh, absolutely. Let me pull up my list because okay. we have, I mean, so Republican Women for Progress, generally speaking, um, you know, we will come out with endorsements or our slate of people that we are following and we like um, a little bit later in the season, you, you know, just because primaries can can come up on, on you so fast. Um, but for some of the worst people in our party, we think that it's important to, to kind of get in early. So Jennifer Strahan is running against uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene. We also have Wendy Navarez, uh, who's running against Madison Cawthorn, who is mm -hmm. another person that we think does not belong in public service. Um, and then um, kind of the other one is Marina Zimmerman, who's running against Lauren Boebert. So those are kind of like the top three. Wow, yeah. Um, yeah, uh, Rep Gosar also has had a challenger, a great, you know, Republican, again, more conservative than I am, but cons perfectly conservative for her district um, in Arizona that uh, she's still weighing whether she's going to get into the race or not. But we have a lot of these women that are kind of coming out and and starting to stake primaries against, I would say, some of the, the worst actors in our, in our party. And on the flip side, the wave of Republican women who came in um, in 2020 have just done a great job. I mean, so many of, of the Republican women, and I think we spoke about this, our frustration with all the coverage that's taken up 
with the Lauren Boberts and Marjorie Taylor Greens of the world, um, and that people don't pay attention, you know, to the Nancy Maces, the Young Kims, um, you know, I, I think that that's a real travesty because those women are actually making a lot of really good moves and, and good pieces of legislation and working um, collaboratively. So I think all, the women who came in in 2020, we are we are thrilled with their performance, and and it really kind of put some wind in our sails to see just how much they have kind of kept, well, they've kind of proven our hypothesis, so to speak, I think, which always is nice to feel, right? <laughs> that you got it right. Um, so yeah, I think uh, I think there's a lot to feel kind of like hopeful about. And then granted, campaign season's hard. So we're going to see how this happens. And like I said, we could see at the end of 2022, I might feel very differently if if we see kind of all of these more populist folks, you know, holding their seats or or making gains in places. Why do you think that there hasn't been that much attention on some of these other, um, the candidates who are already in, like the Nancy Maces? Uh, is it a sense of, per- that there has to be a sense of perfectionism? Because I know Mace has not always voted, quote unquote, on the right side, but she's also made other votes. And, you know, I think in the past, we would have said that you would rely on someone who, has more goes is is more in your favor than against you, but you know that they weren't going to be perfect. That they were going to make some votes that you wouldn't agree with, but they would also make votes that they they would. But it seems almost now we have to have someone that is almost perfect. And um, how do you kind of fight that? Yeah. Um, so we don't hear a lot about the people who are. Uh, you know, I heard it put this way: we want workhorses, not show ponies. Like. And I think we're in this strange time where so much of kind of our governance, right, and the oxygen in the room is taken up by show ponies who, again, want to go have press conferences. I think if you look at most of their staffing, again, I, I'll, I'll, I'll highlight Madison Cawthorn as, as an example here. Although, interestingly enough, now VP Kamala Harris did something very similar when she came into the Senate, which is they didn't they don't have policy staff, right? They have incredibly well-staffed, like, press folks and comms people, but they don't have the policy staff because they're there to make a name for themselves for whatever purpose, right? Like, whether it's because they have aspirations to higher office or they want a deal with Fox or MSNBC or, you know, some iteration of that, a book deal perhaps. Um, So you get a lot of these people that they are solely focused on capitalizing on getting in front of cameras, right? And then you have the people who are actually there to to govern. And not only are they not, you know, they're actively not necessarily thinking about how they get in front of the cameras in the same way, but you have people that are. So you're automatically not going to see as much of them. Um, But then also, I, I have to admit with the level of like attention and death threats and how angry people are, um, and and a lot, I mean, look, you get you get attacks from men and women or to men and women, but the type of gendered attacks that happen on female candidates are really crazy. There are so many death threats and rape threats that are waged at any woman that's kind of in the public space. Um, and these are women who either have stepped away from their families, have decided to like go into public office. I don't think they want to raise their heads high enough that they can they can have that level of anger or vitriol directed at them. Um, to be honest, I think that's what makes you know Liz Cheney different. It also makes Elisa Murkowski a little bit different. Um, you know, not only because they're you know Western Republican women who are a little bit of a different breed, but mm-hmm. you know Liz Cheney is is Dick Cheney's daughter, right? She's not afraid of any of them. And Lisa Murkowski won re-election after the party turned its back on her in 2010 on a write-in ballot. Like, these are women who have been tried and tested, gone through the fires, and are fine standing up against the vitriol. But I think for some of our other members, I'm not sure I would want to get that much attention. (laughs) No, I mean, you know, one of the the things that was astounding a while back was um, with Nancy Mace, and it was something regarding abortion. And I think she had a, a horrible experience as a young woman. I think that she was raped and... Um, She wanted to make sure that there were exceptions for rape and incest with abortion. And I can't remember if it was Marjorie Taylor Greene or some other person got into an argument with her. I mean, for something that 
I think 80% of probably pro-life people would agree with. You know, it, it, it was just astounding that someone would want to just get into this argument for something that seems over nothing. And it seems like that's what a lot of, of people have to face, um, especially women, but it seems like they have to put up with. Yeah, I think that there's a lot of um, allegiance enforced by fear and by bullying. Mm-hmm. And I think that goes on both sides of the aisle, right? Yes. Like I, I do not think that one party has ownership over, <laughs> over that. I think it happens on both sides. And this idea that um, that you need to be in lockstep 100% of the time or you are, you're an enemy, Um is ludicrous. First of all, none of us hold, I I mean, my sister and I are best friends. We work together on this organization and we see each other every single day. And I don't agree with her hundred percent of the time, right? Like It doesn't happen in the real world. And, um, you know, I certainly don't think it's appropriate to accuse somebody of being a traitor to a political party for having differences of opinion on public policy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I I think the other um, example um, and this was in the Atlantic was, of course, the example of Peter Meyer um, from my native state of Michigan, okay. um, just as, as very much early on wanted to be outspoken. And I, I don't think he's stopped being outspoken, but he's had to learn how to know when to say it and when not, because it's just the environment is just so dangerous um, these days. Yeah, it's dangerous. And and the other thing, again, is like, if you come to DC because you want to govern or because you want to make a difference, it's also just noise. Like it gets in the way of you actually doing what you want to do in DC, which is hopefully draft legislation that is going to positively impact not only your community, but also our country, right? <laughs> like, so getting into fights with people who are also, whose brand, whose personal brand is going to benefit from fighting just takes you away from doing the work that you want to do. Mm-hmm. So, look at let's say we look at November, um, and let's say it doesn't work out the way that you hope. Um, that the populists, the Trumpists, actually make more gains. Um, what then is the 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 strategy? Yeah. Um- you know what, Dennis? I have not thought that far because I am really hoping that that, that I, you know, that that is not what happens. Um, you know, I think it will be interesting. There are a few key races, obviously, right? Um, again, I mean, like I'm even thinking about the governor, like the gubernatorial race between um, Brian Kemp and uh, Purdue, right? Mm-hmm. Like. They're going to be really interesting races. And to me, even if we have some populists or people who are more populist kind of come through the primaries and, and win seats um, in this election cycle, the real question is how many of them are the are the horses that Donald Trump was was betting on? Um, because I think really in the long term, the Republican Party has to come up with an actual value proposition for the electorate, right? Like we cannot govern just on the fact that we're owning libs or we're putting, you know, more judges on the bench. Like that's not good enough. There are very real challenges facing our country. Um, And we have to have somebody and we have to have a party that's being led by somebody who's interested in offering solutions and an actual idea as to how to fix things. Um, I will go back to the fact that in 2020, the Republican Party did not have a platform that Donald Trump ran on. They rolled over the 2016 platform. So much had changed, Uh, you know, not to get too in the weeds, but like, let's be real. If you won uh, a presidential election in 2016 and you're running on the same platform and four years later, then theoretically, that means that you didn't accomplish anything in those four years. Like that would That would be my argument. Um, But so I think the Republican Party needs to really spend some time figuring out what we stand for and and what our solutions are for the American public. I think in order to do that, we we have to separate ourselves from Donald Trump. This cannot be a party that is just about fealty to one individual or one or one ideology in terms of this is the one way that you're a Republican. Um, So to me, 
I will still take it as positive <laughs> if even if we have some populists kind of come through or people who I think are are not good for the party come through. Um, it is going to be I do not see how the Democrats come out of this cycle without just hemorrhaging seats, quite frankly. Um, so a few populists coming through. OK, I will still take it as a as a positive and as a win if most of the ones that are being backed by Donald Trump do not make it through. Because, again, I think that further that furthers the separation and the possibility for separation um, of the Republican Party from Donald Trump. Um, so that's kind of like, I know that's not a real answer, but <laughs> that's my answer for right now. <laughs> so one of the things that you said earlier that I think fascinated me was that you kind of said that this wasn't yet Donald Trump's party. Um, I don't think it is. And that's that's fascinating because... There are a lot of people both within the party and without um, people who are never Trumpers and, and or not that say it's already done. This is all um, belongs to Donald Trump. There's not much that we can do. So I'm just curious, why do you believe what you believe and why do you think it's, it, it is not his party yet? Because I think there's still plenty of us that are fighting, right? Like, mm -hmm. I think... Um, I think in the same way about your question about why we're not hearing, why there, why there aren't more stories about um, young Kim and Nancy Mays and like all of the, all of the wonderful women who are, you know, doing the work right now, Republican women who are doing the work in Congress. Um, it feels the same way. Look, I have worked in DC, you know, coming up on 15 years and People not only in D.C., but across the country that I speak to who are Republicans look around and they say, I do not like that. <laughs> I don't like that trajectory, um, you know, and whether or not in 2016 it was because they just couldn't get behind Hillary Clinton. Um, I think you obviously saw this, this shift in, in voting for, for Joe Biden, right? You did see those changes and those gains made in the center right and independent folks, Um we're out there, right? I think we just don't want to deal with being shouted at all the time, right? Mm -hmm. I, I also say this all the time. I feel lucky that I'm a pugilist at heart because I am used to stepping into rooms and being like, yep, yeah, this is what I am. And like, if you have a problem with it, like you can come yell at me if you want. Like I, that isn't going to bother me, right? Um, I am not the norm. Most people don't want to be yelled at. I mean, I would prefer not to be yelled at, but like, I think that people just don't want to be yelled at. They, they want to belong to their community and they are afraid that if they say something out of line, their community will, will disown them or will kick them out. And I think that changes when you're in a voting booth, right? Mm -hmm. When you are by yourself, you get to pull the lever for whoever you want. So I think there is far more, um, there's a far more nuanced space, I think, in the Republican Party than we're often given credit for. And just because there are a lot of people that take up a lot of space in the public psyche, um, and just because you can yell the loudest doesn't mean that there's nobody else kind of in the same room. Um, and I, I, you know, quite frankly, I also see a lot of people, a lot of people trying to invest in the good candidates and the people who are not going to kind of continue leading us down, um, you know, I think a, a pathway that just ends up in more tribalism and ugliness and lack of action, um, so I, I think we're out there. I just think we're quieter. Um, but I also do think it's why I continue to tell people, like, pick your lane and fight, right? Because, again, if you don't live in an open primary state and you are independent, make no mistake, you are throwing away your voting power, right? Because you can vote in the general, but that's not where the real decisions are happening. It's the primaries. So as much as you might not like it, if you think you actually have a good Republican candidate that you can back in your district and you are an independent, but you lean right, make that shift over and support those good candidates. So one of the weird things that has been happening um, in politics these days is I think everyone thought that in 2020, um, the vote for especially the Latino vote was going to go go towards the Dems in, in kind of the same way that African-Americans have. That did not happen. Actually, we've seen it. They actually, um, the Republicans actually, and Donald Trump actually won a greater share 
of Latinos than was expected and, 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 and even more than has been in, a, in quite some time. Um, I've even heard, um, especially among African-American men, that that's been going up. Um, mm -hmm. There's been talk about um, Asians and what, where, where is that going to go in 2022? You know, after years, we've been talking more and more that every person of color was just kind of leaving or, or not every going to vote for the GOP. That's not happening. Um, and I guess, one, I'd like to get your opinion why that's not happening. And then two, um, have you or, or is there any move to have candidates um, of color that will be in the 2022 cycle in the GOP? Yeah, uh, excellent question. So I'll take the, the, the second part first and say, um, so I know that one of the big things that we do in our organization, um, and we like to think of it in this way, you don't get different outputs without different inputs. So if I don't like what the GOP looks like right now, not just in terms of visually what it looks like, but the values that they're putting forward and how they're governing, how do I change the inputs going into that? And we think that it is by creating a more diverse coalition of Republicans. You know, that means gender diversity. That also means racial, ethnic, and religious diversity in terms of who we're electing. So, um, you know, since our inception, we have supported you know, a myriad of really excellent women of color, um, you know, first generation immigrants, um, women from across the full spectrum, right? So not just white women in terms of, uh, of uh, you know, who's running on the Republican side. So I think there are those candidates out there. Um, and it really is just a matter, again, of making sure that you're not only recruiting them, but that you also are supporting their candidacy, right, through whatever mechanisms you can. Um, so that's kind of the my answer to your second part. I'm not sure on kind of like the national stage, like I know that, you know, we'll have different women within our Women to Watch that are, um, you know, women of color. Uh, again, in 2022, on the kind of national stage, I mean, really what we're thinking about, like Herschel Walker um, being kind of like the big one. I'm not sure who else in terms of the Republican establishment kind of is, it has kind of come out of the woodwork or who has been elevated. Um, so I think we have a far way to go as the GOP, right? Like, to be quite clear, I think that we, I don't, we don't have a value proposition for most Americans at this point, um, other than, you know, we continue running on this idea of like lower taxes and less regulation, which I obviously believe <laughs> and support, but at some point you need a little bit more meat on those bones. Um, so I don't think we've done a good job kind of recruiting um, kind of across the spectrum. I think we still have a pretty far way to go. Um, I also think that we as a party need to really reckon with and reconcile um, some of the complaints and some of the issues related to race in this country um, in, in terms of diversity and, you know, racial, you know, bias in institutions and our processes, like we have to reconcile with that. I don't think the Republican Party is on a good pathway in terms of just saying it doesn't exist. Um, I think there are so many people who could argue that. <laughs> um, so we have we have a, a distance to go, I think, in that space. Um, and I think, sorry, there's sirens going on outside my, outside my house. Um, so that's that's kind of one piece. And remind me, okay, so the first piece was around, it was around the- Recruitment of, of, of candidates of color. Oh yeah, and your, your first part was the gains that Donald Trump had made mm -hmm. with yep, yep. different, different um, racial and ethnic groups. So I think- I've read a lot of things related to how some of his kind of persona and the machismo um, appeals to Latino men and um, and certain, you know, African-American men, you know, that feels a little, I don't know, that feels kind of sim like simplistic to me. Like, I don't think that that really encapsulates it. Um I think there's some other components that come from a more conservative background in terms of, um, you know, the religious aspect, you know, you know, the Latin Latin community um, tends to be more religious and more conservative in terms of some of the social stuff. There are certain components, um, you know, within the black community as well that is like deeply faith held religious. And so I think that there are components of, um, 
elevating kind of like traditional family values, so to speak, and like the, you know, the court system and the, the conservative judges that feels appealing mm -hmm. to, uh, to other members of, of different racial and ethnic groups that doesn't feel as immediately apparent, right? That it wouldn't think, you wouldn't think that like the Republican Party, which has so many issues in my mind in terms of um, discrimination, that it would feel like a more natural fit. But if it's also delivering on social issues that people care about, and they're like, I don't really, I don't want to vote just based off of this issue. I care more about these social issues. Um, that I can see some of that shifting happen. Mm -hmm. What do you think about um, Glenn Youngkin? I mean, what effect do you think he's had on the GOP? And what effect do you think that it'll have in November? Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Well, he that was a fascinating race to watch. And so I yes. live in D.C. And, um, you know, it was um, it was really interesting. Right. I think that Terry McAuliffe ran a terrible campaign, first of all. Yeah. But then Youngkin managed to run a really clean, good campaign where he was just close enough to Donald Trump without being, you know, you know, tied to Donald Trump. Um so I think he managed to kind of telegraph some of the issues that that people in Virginia were concerned about as it relates to to schools and schooling and school choice and um you know I think he ran a really good campaign. I am very interested and curious to see how he governs now that he's officially in office. Um, you know, clearly he's going to try to deliver on some of his campaign promises as it relates to schools. Um, I don't agree with kind of the barring of critical race theory. Like, I think that is such, that feels like such a, I, I don't understand how that is becoming a flagpole issue, but I, learning is good. It's always good to learn about every, anything you can, it's good to learn about. So I don't, I don't understand kind of how angry people get about having critical race theory taught. Um, but I think he's going to try to deliver on some of those promises, which I don't think are going to go over particularly well um, with, some of the strongholds that tend to be, you know, bluer in Northern Virginia being the big one, it'll sell really well down South and in more Southern Virginia. Um, but I'm curious to see how he actually governs because I think he ran a clever campaign than I thought he would. I assumed that he was going to cleave really close to Donald Trump and I was very wrong on that. So I think I'm waiting to see what he actually delivers on. Um, but let's be real here. Like he's, you know, a finance bro kind of yuppie. Like I can't imagine that he is like going to be super populist now he actually governs Virginia. Like that wouldn't make any sense to me in terms of him delivering on things. Um, I do think though that Virginia and what and New Jersey, although, you know, you didn't see the Republican gains, but you, I mean, in terms of flipping seats, but you did was, see yeah. how much closer they got. Mm -hmm. Um are real bellwethers. And I think Democrats, I was hoping, and I think some of them have taken this lesson, that really what they should have taken, the takeaway from those races um, and those off-cycle elections uh, should have been that they were going too far and kind of acquiescing too much to the progressives in their party. Um, I think some of them have taken that message. I think others have said, no, the problem is, is that we haven't gone far enough and that's why Republicans made gains. Um, I think if that's the line they're going to run on in, in 22, then their numbers are just going to be even more astronomical in terms of their losses than, I, than I'm thinking they are. Um, but yeah, I think it's Virginia and New Jersey are really interesting as bellwethers. Mm. Actually, that, that is a good question about the Democrats is you would think that this was, especially in 2020 and, and, and this year, because of the state of the GOP right now, this would be a, an opportunity for them to grow their base. Mm -hmm. um, and no one would say that they have to become Republicans to do that. They just need to be more moderating on their on their liberalism but that seems to be falling on deaf ears um at least with some in the party i guess i'm at a loss as to why because there just seems to be have been a prime opportunity and especially in 2020 to really have a solid majority in both houses and that was lost and mm -hmm. and now they at least still had a chance to maybe 
maybe regain or, or try to hold it. And that it's still early, but it still seems like that's slipping away. What's going on? <laughs> I mean, I think they're grappling with their same, but I think they're grappling with their version of populism on their side, right? I, for the life of me, I could not tell you why it made sense to put Bernie Sanders, who, to be very clear, caucuses with the Democrats, but is not a Democrat, to put him in charge of the budget committee. He is an avowed socialist and not a member of the Democratic Party. It blew my mind that that decision was made. Um, and I think... It's really, right, I think progressives to me are the same. They basically are the Tea Party. They're just on the left, right? They are, um, they take up a lot of space. They shout people down. They make it an issue if you are seen as being ideologically impure, right? It's it's the same, to me, same, same. Um, I think I have been disappointed, and I, I mentioned this earlier. This is my disappointment with Joe Biden, right? Like, Joe Biden knows better. He's worked in the city for a very long time. And he also won on the backs of independents and and center right Republicans and people who who decided that they couldn't vote for Donald Trump, right? I don't understand why so many concessions were made to progressives when he immediately came into office, but I think that they are now grappling with what that means because look, they like they lost seats when they shouldn't have lost seats in 2020. And they lost seats, arguably, because progressives were running kind of this national platform of defund the police and a whole bunch of other, other things that people were uncomfortable with. But again, there is this question, I think, within the Democratic Party, and, and it's, it feels like mirror image to me. There's this question about, like, well, growing the base is actually just appealing to more progressives. But that's just not true. We know that they don't win on a national like in a national way, right? Um, you know, AOC has said, like, I could run on my platform anywhere. She sure couldn't. She sure could not, right? And it's very easy for her to say that with the district that she has. Um, like, if it's not her, it's going to be another Democrat, right? It doesn't mm -hmm. really matter. You know, you can't replace Joe Manchin. Like, <laughs> if Joe Manchin doesn't hold that seat as a Democrat, I don't know who West Virginia thinks they're going to put in that Senate seat um, or who the Democrats think they're going to put in that Senate seat. I just... Um, so I think it's a miscalculation. I think it's this kind of echo chamber, drinking your own Kool-Aid, thinking that like being incapable of understanding that there are people who are reasonable, who have different opinions than you do on policy. Um, and I think that that's kind of where the progressives are right now is that they see a lot of their um, of their platform as being also a moral imperative. Um, so if you don't agree with them, you have to be immoral. Like that's mm -hmm. kind of, their their fallback argument um and kind of like with the voting rights kind of like with the voting rights right and let's be very clear here like i am very uncomfortable with some things that are happening across the states in terms mm -hmm. of voting rights and in terms of voting access you cannot pile all of your like harebrained ideas on voting into one package and assume that it's going to pass. It just is like, it just doesn't make any sense. And I really wish that instead of kind of swinging for the fences on certain things, um, the president and the democratic majority had decided to be more circumspect um, in what they were trying to accomplish. I think the bipartisan infrastructure legislation is a tremendous accomplishment. It blows my mind that progressives have like complained about that and didn't vote for it. Six yep. progressives didn't vote for it. <laughs> and that is like real money that's going to your districts and is going to issues you care about, right? The amount of funding going into the Department of Energy for green and clean technologies and energies is enormous, right? You should have been like everybody on the Democratic side should have been lined up behind it. And they weren't because they were holding out hope for this other huge package that was never going to pass at the price tag that they wanted it to. Yeah, I um, live in, since I live in Minneapolis, the, my representative is Ilhan Omar, um, who I'm not particularly crazy not about. No, not no, 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 not really. <laughs> um, but it was like, um, yeah, there are a few, I don't know, infrastructure projects around here that we could use that you just decided wasn't important enough to vote for it and it just kind of was bizarre um, mm -hmm. that these people couldn't 
it, it's like they don't really understand politics to me personally, um, because I think politics is not about the perfect. It's about the good. And, you know, it's about getting what you can. Um, but it seems like anything that is short of the perfect is just evil. Yep. I'm in complete agreement. And I feel like we need less. I think activism has a role in certainly how our our society moves forward and in righting wrongs and in pointing out things that need to be changed. I do not think that we should have a legislative body that's largely made up of activists. It it doesn't it it doesn't yield actual results on on anything, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, Yuval Levin has said that Congress, in many ways, used to be a formative body. Um, it has become a performative body mm-hmm. um, where it's more let me show myself off instead of here's what I learned in the process and how to be a, a good legislator. Yeah. So, yeah. It's also like legislating is at its core is really boring. <laughs> Like it is. It's not exciting. And you and you, you know, you look at issues and you say, okay, what solutions can we come up with? And then you just crank through those solutions and you workshop it and you brainstorm and then you debate it. Like it is a slow, not exciting process for most folks. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Certainly not when we all are like losing our attention spans. I think like what are the most recent thing I've seen on attention span is that we can only keep it for like 20 seconds at the most. <laughs> so I yes, think indeed. As, a, as a society, we also have lost the ability, I think, to 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 focus on things for a longer term outcome. Mm-hmm. So kind of final question here is there are a lot of uh, people who would in the past consider themselves Republicans or and probably would love to get back there again that I think are consider themselves homeless right now. Mm-hmm. You know? They don't feel comfortable with the GOP. They may have not yet or decided the Democrats are still kind of too far away, but, you know, they'll vote for them sometimes. Um, But they just feel like there's no place for them in politics anymore. What do you say to those people, especially to maybe get them involved, to hopefully maybe bring the GOP back to some sense of functioning? Again. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it makes total sense to me why people feel politically homeless. I have felt that way myself. Um, and what has gotten me through is my community with, um, you know, the never Trumpers that I fell in with. And then my organization, Republican Women for Progress, is kind of, um, you know, we're kind of the island of misfit toys for all of the different Republican women across the country that that feel homeless. So um, it's important. It's important to have a community. I think at the same time that I want politics to go back to being local, I do also think that right now, if you do feel politically homeless, kind of in the Republican Party or having just left it or in kind of like this centrist space on either side, um, there are national organizations, you know, again, like mine, that are constantly looking for people and will hopefully, you know, give you also that like bolstering of the fact that you're not alone, right? Like you're not looking around at this world being like, this feels, I'm uncomfortable with the direction of things and I don't like what's happening. You're not alone. There are plenty of us out there. Um, And it's really an issue of how you, how you find that, I don't want to say replacement community, right? Because that feels like you don't need to say goodbye to everything you knew just because we're in the place that we are right now. But Sometimes you can build new relationships and new communities. Um, And I think it's really important to give people that space because you cannot ask somebody to leave their community or to self-isolate out of their community without giving them another community to to enter into, right? Like we are social beings. Human beings are social. We need that interaction and we need that support of of a broader community. So I think if you're feeling disenfranchised, if you feel politically homeless, um, There are all sorts of organizations, again, you know, I mean, there's my organization, Um, you know, I know that Renew America is trying to kind of build out different state chapters. Um, There are also kind of like nonpartisan groups that are focused on either candidate training or support or different um, 
that are like different issue areas that that if you are particularly passionate about climate change, for instance, which you can be a Republican and passionate about needing climate action, um, that, that you can get involved with. Um, I think finding a community that speaks to your political leanings um, is, is probably the most important thing. And then I think just like take a look at who's on your slate for your elect for your upcoming elections and just do some research, right? Because I would put money on there being a candidate if you are, you know, a, a disenfranchised or politically homeless Republican. I would put money on the fact that you probably have somebody on that's coming up on the slate, uh, you know, state, local, or federal that either suits your political leanings a little bit better or speaks to your concerns. And that can be everything down to like your local dog catcher, right? But if you find those people and if you do that research and you reach out, I guarantee you, you will start finding like a broader community because candidates for anything have support systems. You know, if they're, if they're like, because people have to, they have to get people to like them, right? They have to get people to like buy into what they're selling. And so also if there's somebody that speaks to you in, in one of your elections, I would put money on their supporters or their campaign staff or the people that are or that they surround themselves with are probably pretty similarly aligned, even if you'll know, have differences here and there. Um, and I think that that's another great way that you can both have an impact in what's going on in, in the elections and the overall health of the Republican Party, but also give yourself some new people mm-hmm. that might be a little bit more to where you are right now. Okay. Um, and... Would you be willing to kind of give the um, web address for Republican women and Twitter and all that if, um, so people can hopefully get involved? Yes. So we are at gopwomenforprogress.org. Um, and our Twitter handle, let me pull it up because I feel like we, well, when we first launched, we wanted to be Go Progress, which was mm-hmm. GOP Progress. Uh, yep. <laughs> um, but that was somewhat taken. And so I always forget we're kind of different iterations um, on our different socials. Um, so I think, okay. So our Twitter handle is RWFP, P being mm-hmm. for progress, and then, then like progress. So RWF Progress okay. is our Twitter handle. And I think that's the same for Instagram, but let me just double check. Yeah, the same as... No, that's not our same. Hold on. My apologies. I should have had this locked and loaded. This is, you know, this is how I know I'm getting a little bit older as I'm so terrible with like website. I know, I I know. (laughs) Okay. So on on Instagram, we're our women for progress. Okay. Um, So yeah, we come check us out um, and we're going to be rolling out a whole bunch of different information um, on our candidates that we're following and tracking. Um, And also if you're a Republican woman, you want to run for office, any office, please get in touch. We're happy to happy to support you. And I do think that this is really important. You don't have to be, you don't have to mirror my my brand of republicanism because Republicans in California to Georgia to Oklahoma to Minnesota, we all look a little bit different. Mm-hmm. And so you do not need to be one type. Like we do not have a litmus test. If you are a Republican woman who wants to govern, look us up. We're here to support you. All right. Well, thank you, Ariel, for coming back. Um, this was a great conversation. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you so much. And, you know, you know where to find me if you need me again. Always happy to talk about things. All right. Take care. All right. Thanks. again to Ariel for coming back on the show. I do hope to have her on again, hopefully maybe even after the election. So is it too late for the GOP? You know what? I really don't know. I'm, I'm really thankful that Ariel and others are at least trying. But it is really hard these days to have hope that things are going to change. 
personally believe it is vitally important for American democracy to have two strong political parties, especially to not have one that is seeking to become proto-fascist. I've said this before, but having a conservative party that heeds the rule of law is the key to a strong democracy. And right now, we don't have such a party. I really hope this push by Ariel and others in Republican Women for Progress will succeed. For the health and future of our democracy, it really needs to. So before we go, a few housekeeping notes. Um, make sure to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. The links are in the show notes. Um, you can visit us at enroutepodcast.org. Um, I'm trying to start to place some additional material about um, each podcast episode. Um, if you have a question or a comment, you know, I would really like if you drop me an email. Um, and you can drop it at a new email address. It is Reverend podcast at gmail.com. You know, I really do want to hear your questions and your comments, so please send those emails. Final thing, please consider leaving a rating or a review on, a, on your favorite podcast app. Podcasts, kind of like everything else online these days, run on algorithms. And the more positive reviews, the more it is easier to find this podcast. And I think that we really need a podcast that can look at mainline Protestantism with a critical and a very a curious eye. And I need your help to make the message of this podcast spread. And I've even made it easy for folks. So if you click on the link um, in the show notes, and I actually will tell you the link, um, that'll lead you basically to directly to a podcast app of your choice. So if you go to ratethispodcast.com backslash church and main, so church and A-N-D, main, M-I-M-A-I-N, um, you can leave your rating or review on whatever podcast um, service you like. So coming up, um, there is going to be a podcast on um, congregational vitality and uh, plan to have another one on COVID and faith. So that is it for this episode of En Route, a journey on faith and modern life. I'm Dennis Sanders, your host. Take care, Godspeed, and see you soon.